What is up guys, Mental Muscle Coach here. And without further ado, it's time for the ultimate question. The psychology of the honeymoon phase, how to keep it alive or how to bring it back to your current relationship. No, there are so many norms and concepts societally that we've just come to accept, whereas we should really start questioning them. Like for example, this concept of the honeymoon phase, which is this space where early in the relationship, it seems like, you know, to each respective partner, what the other does in says and looks like, you know, the way they smell, everything seems to be perfect. You know, there's this enhanced level of puppy dog love, for example, or PSA. You know, there's this enhanced level of, of interaction and engagement, excitement, even infatuation towards one another. You know, typically the honeymoon phase is accompanied by a lot more sexual activity, all of these different elements. But the thing is, we inherently call it a phase. We accept through our very designation and identification of the term. We're accepting that it is a phase that is merely to be passed through. That's a representation of the, the youth, the, the early nature, the lack of maturity in the relationship, as opposed to saying, hey, this is a dynamic that often occurs in relationships. And if we can figure out the respective variables that creates and maintains this, maybe we can make it something that's long-term. Maybe it can become a consistent element of the couple culture, as opposed to it being something that is merely phase related, like a circadian rhythm. And that's what I want to get into today. This isn't about me proclaiming some unrealistic concept that, oh, relationships can be, you know, amazing and perfect 24 seven, obviously not. But what I am saying is when we take the elements of what's happening, when we do something right, if we can identify what's going on when we're doing something right, and we can break down the constituent variables, we can apply those long term to get better results. Results. This is a fundamental element of High Performance 101. Find out the shit you're doing well, figure out why you're doing it well, and replicate that shit. So that's what we're doing today. So let's get into it, y'all. What are the factors that create the honeymoon phase or ultimately cause the honeymoon phase to end? The first element that causes the degradation of the honeymoon phase is what's called the law of familiarity, which is basically a very simple concept, which is that our brains are programmed. We naturally tend to adjust to the stimuli that we encounter consistently in our lives. So let's say, for example, if you eat the same food every day, even if it's your absolute favorite food, if you eat it three times a day for two weeks, obviously your responsiveness to that food is going to change. You become so familiar to it that over time you even get you know sick of it now mind you that's an extreme example but it's ultimately saying the same thing which is that when we're engaging a stimuli the way over time and consistently the way that it causes an internal response on our emotional and cognitive level will decrease we're not going to be as receptive or responsive to it in the same way as if somebody's tapping on your arm in the same spot over and over and over again that spot may be sensitive at first but after an hour of doing that, it's going to kind of numb out. You know what I'm saying? So respectively, this manifests in relationship. When a person's looking at their partner, even if they see all these beautiful attributes that they care about, that they value, and they say, wow, I love this person. This person's amazing. I want to, you know, give my time, my, my energy, my focus to this person. And so that facilitates the honeymoon phase. But then as that law of familiarity kicks in, they begin to say, okay, you know, I, I, I kind of see how this works now. I, this person's kind of a little bit more predictable to me. This there's not a mu as much spontaneity. And so they see a decline of their interest, a decline of their focus, a decline of the emotional and cognitive factors that ultimately help them to feel the way that they did towards their partner. But here's the thing. Here's what we need to understand. This isn't just some natural innate thing where you're doomed to fall victim to the law of familiarity and your partner is doomed to find you boring eventually and predictable because ultimately this becomes a muscle. This is a skill, something that can, that can uh, be acquired, something that can be trained or strengthened. We've largely been conditioned to uh, become so familiar with things regardless of how great or shitty they are respectively. 
We're conditioned because of the fact that we have so many stimuli around us. We've got social media, we've got alarms and stuff pinging all over the place and it takes our attention. But in the same way we've been trained to take things for granted essentially, we can also train ourselves to develop appreciation, to develop gratitude. This is the power of doing things like a gratitude journal in the morning. It's, it's strengthening that muscle and changing the way that it responds so that you can have a greater level of appreciation for your life and for your partner. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The second factor that causes the degradation of the honeymoon phase is a loss of presence. So here's the thing. Dr. Bruce Lipton, who is the uh, pioneer of epigenetics, essentially, he made the statement that when it comes to our typical human experiences, falling in love is like the ultimate submergence. It is the, the ultimate dive into a state of presence and awareness for the uh, typical human brain. Those of you who are familiar with mindfulness, with the uh, cognitive and experiential effects of meditation, those of you who are into you know spirituality, yogic tradition, things like that, you'll be very comfortable with the concept of mindfulness, with you know awareness, with being in the present moment, where our focus is not in the past, is not in the future, it is fully immersed in what's happening right now. I'm fully engaging with the, the stimuli, the things around me, the, the, the sights, the sounds, the smells, what have you. And when a person is in love, it plunges them into the state of mindfulness, into the state of awareness. It's like, you know, have you ever had that experience where you're sitting with somebody you love and it feels like time stops, where you're not thinking about anything else, you're not thinking about anyone else, you're not thinking about what you gotta do at work tomorrow, you're just fully immersed in the moment with that person. You're having a an experience of awareness, of, 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 of deep relationship, not only with the person, but with the now. And that happens, it's not random, it's not magic. That is a neurochemical occurrence. It is a melting pot of oxytocin, of you know serotonin, of all of these, these elements that are physical, that are neurochemical, and they're being released within your mind and your body, and it's causing you to feel that way. Why does that state of presence leave people in the relationship? Why does that state of presence go away and they begin to you know have a greater level of focus again in the past and future? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one is noticing imperfections in the partner that you may have deified in the honeymoon phase, where you begin to see the mistakes, you begin to see the, the, the aspects of them that you may not like as much, the aspects of them you may find annoying. And so as you start to focus on those negatives, as you start to focus on those elements that bring you into past and future, it ultimately takes you off of your magic cloud, if you will. And so now you're back on the ground and you're saying, oh, wow, uh, this isn't exactly what I, what I thought it was. I mean, yeah, it's good, but I'm not on that cloud nine anymore. Or other factors that are external to the relationship end up coming in, like external stress factors, like maybe stress from work, you know, maybe stress from family, maybe uh, uh, past conditioning. Like if one of the people or both people have baggage and that baggage gets brought into the relationship, you see the connection here, regardless of what it is that brings people out of the now, it is ultimately a variable, whether it is internal or external to the relationship, a variable that brings the focus of one or both people into the past and or future. And so when their focus averts, because remember, where your focus goes, your energy flows. So if your focus has now left the present with your partner and with yourself, if it has gone back to past and future, ultimately, that's where your energy will go as well. That's going to change the dynamic. It's going to change the couple culture. And so the honeymoon phase then goes back to what we define as a normal relationship. So now that the law of familiarity has kicked in, they're not your new shiny toy anymore. You know, you've gotten acclimated, you've gotten accustomed to them. Um, now that the lack of presence has kicked in, so you're not in such a state of mindful awareness anymore. So your focus is on past and future, it's not on the present moment with them. Now the final nail in the coffin, which is your ultimate foundational focus changes from I love them 
to I want this. Your focus leaves from the greatness or your appreciation of the person and it switches to your focus on your needs. It goes from a focus on love to a focus on fear or want because the fear arises when we feel like our wants may not be met. So with the culmination of these three factors, we see the degradation of the honeymoon phase. I gotta let you know, gotta let you know how it is that you stop the honeymoon phase from degrading or rather how it is that you bring it back. What's the secret, Ryan? What's the secret? So here's the way we're going to focus on this, all right? We're going to make it real simple. This is the three F's of the honeymoon phase. You got familiarity, fuck-ups, and focus. I'm going to break all three of these down, just like I just did now. We, we already talked about these three, but I'm saying this is the way that we're going to remember these three topics. This is the acronym right here, okay? So first off is the familiarity. How is it that we're going to uh, mitigate that law of familiarity aspect? Well, without a doubt, the thing we need to do is on both sides. Number one, we need to identify that becoming familiar, becoming less grateful for the things that we see consistently and the people that we engage with consistently is a muscle that we need to work. We need to train our gratitude. We need to train our appreciation. And if our conditioning isn't isn't uh, optimized for being grateful, then we need to hop on that. Because if, if we're not able to appreciate the other person, then you know what? That's largely on us. We need to step our shit up because part of being an exceptional partner is learning how to understand and appreciate what uh, aspects of the other person we should be grateful for, that we should value, you know what I'm saying? But the other element for the other partner, or rather for you as well, is spontaneity. If you wanna break up the familiarity, you gotta be spontaneous. You have to throw in some some new uh, uh, shifts, some different variables, some different dynamics, because you don't wanna be purely predictable. Because mind you, I wanna go hard on this. Esther Perel talks so much about the association between spontaneity and excitement and lust and love. All of these things are so interconnected. But to save you the extra 10 minutes, hear me, and I'm gonna put some videos on this later. Don't worry, I got you. Spontaneity. She actually, Esther Perel actually gave a quote. She said something very interesting. She said, I have had multiple affairs throughout my marriage. It just so happens that all of them have been with the same man. She said, I've been with my husband all of these years, but he has continued to evolve. I have continued to evolve. He has been different men throughout the time I've loved him. And for that reason, it continues to be immensely exciting. Do something out of character, do things that are different, do things that aren't predictable. Because remember, this isn't just, you know, an emotional thing or, or like a, you know, a random thing. This is, this is science, this is neurochemicals. So when you come to understand how it's working on the biological, emotional, and cognitive levels, you get to, to leverage those things for your benefit. My dude, why you think I became a psychologist, my G? No, I'm playing with you, but hey. Second one is fuck ups. When we identify that, you know, we're finding the imperfections in our partner and they're kind of taking them off of that pedestal. We need to understand that we shouldn't have our partner on a pedestal in the first place. Because when you put someone on a pedestal, that's simply putting them in a position that's easy to fall from. It's putting them in a state that's unrealistic. It's denying their humanhood because of the fact that we get a high off of deifying them. We get to make them some sort of savior if we put them perfect in our heads. Oh wow, they're perfect. They're the perfect answer to my needs and my wants. Us seeing someone as perfect isn't doing them a favor. It's us trying to put them in a cognitive position in our heads that's beneficial to us. But when we can acknowledge that our partner is human just like we are, and we don't put them on that pedestal on the first place, and we allow ourselves to feel gratitude for them while they're not on the pedestal, that gratitude won't leave when we identify their imperfections to a more thorough degree. And so now, obviously, this isn't saying, you know, whatever mistakes or whatever imperfections somebody has, you got to stay with them no matter what. No shit, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that when we start to see them as less perfect, we gotta love them anyway and acknowledge, hey, this is something that's gonna happen and I'm imperfect too. Finally, the third F is focus. Train your focus, train your ability to be in the present moment, your mindfulness, you know, through meditation, through uh, self-inquiry, because the ultimate thing is this. Everything in this world, when it comes to our personal identity, when it comes to other people, when it comes to our success, every single one of the important skills in life are all relational. 
And so the reason why relationships end up being so difficult for people is because we struggle the most in the area of relationship. And I don't just mean romantically. When it comes to, you know, our relationship with our bodies, our relationship with the earth, our relationship with, with, with work and productivity, all of these things are relational. And so when we look at the difficulty people often experience in relationship, it is merely a manifestation of a human issue, not a couple issue, a human issue, which is that we need to become more adept at the skills that facilitate relationship. The primary of which is focus, being able to bring our awareness to the present moment. But okay, guys, I hope you guys benefited from this. My shoulder is exhausted from holding this phone up, but I love you. Mental Muscle Coach out. Like, share, spread the word, and peace.